Hi everyone, my name is Terry Brown. I'm with the Central Carolina Community College Small Business Center and thank you for joining us today for the business of hemp. I have with me today Emily Febles and Laura Lauper. Say hi Emily and Laura. Hey everybody, hi. welcome. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us today and if this is your first time on a webinar with us, let me explain a little bit how the, about how this is going to work. Um, on your screen you should see three icons at the bottom. One is for a Q&A, one is for chat, and one is to raise your hand. We have a lot of people on this call today, so please do not raise your hand because we don't have any way to call on you. Um, but if you do have questions along the way, you can type them into the Q&A box. Um, you can also type any comments or questions you have into the chat box. So we'll be monitoring both, whichever one you feel comfortable using, um, please do that. Um, also, um, after this webinar today, Laura will um, be sending out copies of the YouTube video link. So if you miss anything along the way and you'd like to review the video, she'll be sending that out within the next couple of days and also a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So don't feel like you have to write everything down today. She'll be sending that out to you. All right, Laura. So thank you for joining us today. And I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself and introduce Emily. Great, good morning everybody. Um, today we have um, a, the second in our series of 2018 webinars. We are discussing the business of hemp. Uh, we know that many extension agents and small business centers are increasingly getting questions about this new agricultural industry in North Carolina. We're extremely uh, fortunate that we do have these trials happening in North Carolina and we have some really good uh, specific details to share with you today. Uh, I did want to tell you about um, our agenda for the day is I'm going to do a little introduction of North Carolina Growing Together and then Emily uh, will do her slide set and then we'll have our question and answers at the end of the session today. I wanted to uh, just give you all a little bit of background about the North Carolina Growing Together project. We are on our sixth year project to help farmers gain more capacity in the supply chain uh, around food and farming businesses. And this is a key element that we have found is working with small business centers around the state to help them support farmers and their entrepreneurial activities. It's been a fantastic partnership. And we did hear directly from SBCs that they are getting questions about hemp. And so this is a way that we are partnering uh, with you all to support you in your efforts. Um, so you are muted. I just want to go over a few things. Terry did too, but if, if you have trouble during the webinar, you can send a private message to me or Terry by selecting send private message and hopefully we'll be able to help you out. Uh, but again, as Terry mentioned, um, this webinar will be available um, online live, the live re YouTube recording as well as the um, PowerPoint presentation with all of the live links that Emily will be covering. So uh, you will have more information going forward. Um, so after the webinar ends, yeah, you will have that information. And please let us know, uh, contact me directly if there's other um, webinar topics that you uh, think would be helpful. We're gonna announce our, our, the next webinar in the series at the end of this one. So I want to uh, introduce Emily. Uh, Emily is new to North Carolina. We're very fortunate that she came out of Washington State's pilot program. So she has had some on the ground experience that she can bring us in North Carolina. Uh, in addition to that on the ground experience, she has a, an excellent academic um, experience coming with a law degree and an agribusiness degree and experience in the field with these work. And so we're just thrilled to have her here in North Carolina. And I know she's very busy. Um, we'll be able to show you a schedule of upcoming events that maybe you can catch her in person in the coming months. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Emily and uh, look forward to uh, hearing your questions and uh, sharing this wonderful information about hemp in North Carolina. So welcome, Emily. Okay, um, let's see.
Okay, can, can, I, can you guys hear me? Yeah. And see my screen, Laura? Okay. So, um, yes. as Laura said, my name is Emily Febles. I'm the um, industrial. Pardon? Emily, you'll need to share your screen. We can't see your screen yet. Uh, I thought I did. Okay, hold on one second. Um, let's try this. Can you see it now? Uh, click desktop. There you go. There we go. Okay. And now. How about now? They Great. are perfect. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about um, industrial hemp and um, some of the questions I get um, most often about the industrial hemp program, about industrial hemp in general. Um, one of the questions I get um, asked a lot is what's the difference between uh, marijuana and hemp? Well, um, they're both varieties of cannabis that were developed um, due to selective breeding. Industrial hemp was bred for um, many, many years um, for its fiber and its seed oil, and obviously marijuana was bred for its narcotic components. When you're talking about um, cannabis that can be smoked for a high today with that high THC content in states like Colorado and Washington, you're really talking about a THC concentration that gets up to be about uh, 25%. But by law, really, industrial hemp has less than 0.3% THC. So really, the THC in industrial hemp is um, basically non-existent. And you might say to me, Emily, well, that's the same thing though, right? Well, you know, kind of. We've been breeding plants for a long time for a lot of different purposes. Um, for example, we bred feed corn and sweet corn. They're both corns, but you wouldn't take some feed corn and slap it on the grill for your, your children or your grandchildren. We've been breeding plants for different purposes for, for all of human history. Another question I get a lot is, will eating the seeds of the industrial hemp plant get me high? Um, seeds are very nutritious. Um, they, you can use them um, for seed oil, for cooking. Obviously, you can use them just sprinkled on a salad. By the time those varieties of industrial hemp that are grown for food um, are processed, they contain 001% THC. So you really can um, eat as many of them as you want. You're not going to worry about getting high or failing a drug, drug test. Right now, um, a majority, you can go to Costco, you can go to Walmart, you can actually buy hemp seeds and you can use them today here in North Carolina, but most likely those were grown in Canada. So it would be really great if one day our farmers could take back some of that market share from importing this stuff from Canada and have our, our own farmers growing industrial hemp grain for food. And one thing I do want um, to, to note right away is that the Industrial Hemp Commission, that's the, com the commission that oversees those licenses to grow industrial hemp, it really doesn't oversee the retail market of industrial hemp. So when you're looking at something like um, a peanut commission, an agricultural commission that provides oversight um, for peanuts, they oversee the growing peanuts, the peanuts in the field. Um, but when, that, when those peanuts are made into a product like peanut butter, that commission might not oversee that anymore. That, that actually would be overseen by the Department of Agriculture's Consumer Services Food and Drug Division. It's the same thing with industrial hemp. The commission oversees the growing of industrial hemp plants, but really when that product, when that hemp is made into different products, it still has to follow all the state and federal laws and, and regulations um, involving whatever product it's made into. So there are three main end markets for industrial hemp production, and that's um, the seed or grain for those food products I mentioned, the fiber, which um, has had a long history, and then the floral extracts. That's, um, you might have heard about it, um, it's being processed a lot for CBD. Um, the end market um, that you, or variety that you want to grow um, industrial hemp is really, really important because it really determines how you grow the, your industrial hemp and, um, you know, what, um, what variety you might need to start your industrial hemp crop. So when you're talking about fiber or grain, those are traditional field crops. You use combines, harvesters, um, it's grown in pivots with large acres, it's grown from seed. You need those male and female plants, especially if you're growing for grain, you can't uh, have a baby plant without male and female. So um, when you're talking about the fiber or the grain um, crops, you're really talking about a pretty traditional, um, a pretty tra tra traditional crop. When you're talking about growing for those flower extracts, you're really talking about more of a horticulture crop. 
uh, many times it's grown in greenhouses. It's very difficult to mechanize. You can see that picture on the bottom of it being grown outdoors. You see it's very different than the pictures on the left where you see it grown in, in rows. Um, you really need large spacing. It's very hard to mechanize. And it's also grown from live plants, from clones or transplants, because you're only looking for those flowers. You don't want any male plants. So um, it's grown very differently if you're going to grow industrial hemp to produce those floral extracts. So here's some pictures you can see of the fiber or the grain. And then on the other side, that is if you're doing that more horticultural production for the flower tops. So when you're talking about growing the end, for the end market seed for food, um, you're talking about growing it to eat the seed like a sunflower seed or to press it for the oil like sunflower seed oil or canola oil. Um, you can also use the seed oil in industrial applications. It's being used quite um, widely for lip balm, shampoos. Um, when you're growing it, you're talking about growing a shoulder to waist high plant. Um, industrial hemp uh, as a field crop was bred very tall, 12 foot tall plants. Over time, they've actually bred um, seed for food plants to be shorter so you won't have to climb up on that 12 foot ladder to try and harvest your grain. When you're talking about the end market for fiber, you can see a picture of the guy in the field. It's very, very tall, 10 to 12 feet tall plants. That's because you really want those long, luxurious fibers um, that are involved in that long, woody stalk of the industrial hemp plant. And I do get the question, um, can you grow industrial hemp for both um, fiber and seed? And the answer is yes. There are dual purpose varieties of industrial hemp that are grown a little bit shorter for those big seed tops, but there's still enough fiber on the plant that you would be able to use it in a fiber industry. But really when you're talking about those dual purpose varieties, you're really talking about more towards the automotive, petroleum, and animal bedding, those kinds of industrial industries. Um, many times um, people who are looking to, for fiber for t-shirts or parachutes, the like, um, they actually want those really tall varieties where they can get better quality fiber. Um, here's just a couple examples of some products made from the fiber and the seed oil. Um, you know, again, there's um, the t-shirts, rope, that's a very traditional application for industrial hemp. Uh, you can see that on the bottom, there's um, a product called Hempcrete. Um, that's really concrete made from hemp fibers. Um, people are very excited about it. Um, right now, you could be driving uh, a car with an industrial hemp or an industrial hemp composite door panel in it. A lot of companies are using hemp and other green products to meet their green initiative. So right now, today, you could have a car with um, hemp in it. And then on the other side, you see, um, you know, like I said, shampoos and lip balms. Um, there's hemp milk. That's like almond milk, only hemp seed. Um, hemp seed cooking oil there at the bottom. I guess a lot of people are very excited um, if they're on a low, a low carb diet because hemp seed protein has a lot of um, protein but not a lot of carbs. So a lot of um, applications for um, seed and fiber. When you're talking about growing for the end market of those floral extracts, you're talking about growing the plant for sort of the medical pharmaceutical type industry. You really want to grow your industrial hemp to produce very fragrant, oily buds or flowers. The end market itself is the flowers. So when you're a farmer and you're growing for this this market, you're talking about growing the flowers. You can see that's an, an actual barn in North Carolina from 217 with their hanging um, flowers upside down to dry. And so uh, the other question I get a lot is, well, how do I get paid? Well, when you're growing seed or grain, you're growing um, a much more traditional crop. So um, oftentimes you will get a contract with a company to grow industrial hemp. The company may even tell you what variety of industrial hemp they want or when to harvest it. So if you're growing for a textile company, for example, they might want a specific grade of fiber. So they might tell you um, a specific variety of hemp to grow and when, when specifically to harvest it to get that good quality fiber. But really the market is still developing around industrial hemp. So even today you may have to grow without a contract. When you're talking about growing for those floral extracts, it gets a little more complicated. Your, pay your payment depends on the chemical percentage contained in your batch of industrial hemp plants. So they'll come out, they'll take a composite, it will go back to the lab and they will test it for those chemicals that are in the floral materials. The more that your plants contain, the more that can be extracted by the end, the end processor for profit. So if your plants contain a lot of chemical, you'll get paid more and if they contain less 
of that chemical, um, you'll get paid less. So here, this is a fake um, lab report, but you can see, for example, this one chemical that um, people are looking for when they are processing for flowers is CBD. Um, you can see in this case, this fake um, lab report, this person got 22% CBD in their, in their crop. So obviously you could see that would be worth um, a lot of money. If they would have gotten five or 10%, they would have gotten less money. And I get the question a lot, what is CBD? CBD belongs to a group of chemicals called cab cannabinoids. There's at least 113. Um, scientists think that there actually may be more than that, but those are the ones we know of. One of them is THC. That's the stuff that gets you high. Um, cannabidiol or CBD is one of the ones that people are extracting for. And then there are, uh, you know, 100 others, CBN, CB, CBD, CBC. So, um, it depends on what you are, um, what company um, is buying your floral tops for to what, um, what chemical they might be looking for. And cannabinoids um, really developed, um, they're, they're, they develop in these, I'm, I, there's a little arrow if you look on the bottom right, um, in these golf ball like, they look like golf balls on tees on the floral parts of the industrial hemp plant. Um, what comes out of them is sort of a sticky goo, and that's where a vast majority of those chemicals are contained. They're actually contained in the floral parts of the plant. So sometimes you'll hear the term hemp oil, and sometimes you really do need to clarify with the person you're speaking to. Are they talking about the oil that is extracted from those floral parts? Or are they talking about the seed oil that comes from pressing the seed like sunflower seed oil or canola oil? Um, the trichome glands, those are those little golf balls on the tees, they probably developed as um, the defense mechanism for the cannabis plant, sort of protecting it from its environment. You can see a picture up there where, um, where that fl a little fly got caught in there and died. So probably as a protection mechanism. I get asked a lot, what's the market look like for industrial hemp in the United States? Well, here's a, um, a little snapshot from 215 and a little snapshot, uh, snapshot from 216. You can see pretty much across the board, um, industrial hemp products in the United States are sort of on the rise. With food, you had about 89 million in 215 and it was up to 130 um, by 216. I think this is really because more and more states are coming online with their industrial hemp programs and um, there's more consumer awareness about industrial hemp ha happening across the nation. Right now, at least 33 uh, states have laws in place related to hemp, and um, actually that number right now is 14 states have active pilot pro programs. That means they're actively growing industrial hemp in their state. I suspect we'll see about three more come online in 2018, so probably about 16 or 17 states will have active industrial hemp programs in 2018. Um, this is a little bit of old data, but in um, 2017, we did have about 100 people licensed to grow industrial hemp here in North Carolina. We had about 2,000 acres outdoors planted with industrial hemp, and we had about 150 um, square feet of 150,000 square feet of greenhouse space. Here you can see what 2017 really looked like across the state. Um, I would expect to see more counties come online um, with um, one or two industrial hemp growers in 218. And, um, you know, really it's a chicken and the egg sort of scenario. We need both growers and processors to develop an industry. We can't have um, just hundreds of people growing industrial hemp and no end market to take it to. And we can't have, you know, it's unlikely that a big company might come in and put in a big plant if they know that there's not going to be the supply to meet their demand. So we need both processors and um, growers um, in North Carolina to continue to develop this industry. So the other question I get a lot is how do I participate in the prog program? Well, you do need a license to grow industrial hemp in North Carolina. So you need to go online and fill out your application. Um, and one of the key components to um, the application is that you have filed a Schedule F on your on your federal tax returns. That's how they verify that you have farming experience. There's, um, there's four ways, but I would say 99% of the time you're going to use that Schedule F. Um, you just staple that to your application or you turn it in via PDF um, on the Department of Ag's website. 
And then again, you need to really decide why you're growing industrial hemp. Are you growing it for the fiber? Are you growing it for the grain? Or are you growing it for those floral materials? And then of course, you really need to begin making connections with your processors unless you're self-processing. Um, you can you need to source your propagative material. So that's the seeds or the clones. If you are bringing in your seed from um, abroad, from Italy or Canada, someplace like that, um, the, the NCDA has some paperwork that you need to fill out to actually get those seeds into the state. Um, if you're sourcing clones, live plants, and we did have people get those from K Kentucky and Colorado last year, and um, there's um, other states that do have clones available, so um, definitely shop around for your propagative material. And then you should definitely understand the risks of growing industrial hemp. Um, when you sign up for the program, when you sign um, your license, basically you're saying that the Department of Ag and Law Enforcement can in inspect your industrial hemp at any time. Um, they can come onto your farm um, and, and look at your crop. There's also um, an annual THC test, so um, they'll take a sample of your test back to the lab and test it to make sure that it is testing under that 0.3%. And you should know that even if you do everything correctly, if your plants test over that 0.3 THC, um, they will be destroyed. So um, this is an actual industrial hemp field in North Carolina in 2017. Some portion of their industrial hemp crop did test over that 0.3 limit and they did have to destroy it. Of about 125 growers in 2017, about 10% or 10, not 10%, 10 did have to destroy their crop this year. We're really just learning um, what causes those THC spikes in industrial hemp. So um, it's always a little bit more risky than just growing corn or tomatoes. And you should understand that there's no crop insurance right now for industrial hemp and there's no labeled her pesticides or herbicides for the crop. So if you're looking for that application to grow industrial hemp that is on the Department of Agriculture's website, and that link is at the top, you can see that link to um, the application right there by the red arrow. Um, while we're on this page, I don't know if I've included it later, but you can also see a list of registered processors. So if you're looking for somebody to process the industrial hemp you grow, you can actually click on that. And there is a list of people who are processing industrial hemp here in North Carolina for you to contact. Um, so here's um, uh, sort of a little bit about the application. There is both a paper application if you choose to mail it or an online application that you, you can submit. That application has some um, basic stuff like um, you need to include your name, your address, um, how many acres or square feet of industrial hemp you plan to grow, the GPS coordinates of where it'll be grown, the storage location of where it might be stored. Um, there's an agreement page of things that you agree to by getting a license to grow industrial hemp. And there is a um, fee to be involved in the program. And if you have questions about the um, application itself, the appropriate contact to talk about application related questions, or if you're having issues submitting your application or technical problems, that's Megan Roche over at the Department of Agriculture. Her contact information is here, and I think you'll be getting a copy of this presentation, but should you lose it, um, her contact information is also on the Department of Ag's webpage. Um, and um, if you're just looking um, really quick to try and find some planting sources, some seeds or clones to start your industrial hemp um, your um, business, um, on, the, on the portal for NC State, there is a sort of, um, it's, it's not exhaustive, but it's at least a place to start sourcing um, seeds, clones, transplants. So if somebody comes to you looking for that, um, for that resource that is on our portal, you can at least give them a starting place to look. Um, the clone market is quite pricey, so even when you're talking about buying 50 trays of um, industrial hemp clones, you're talking about $4 per plug. So when you're talking about three, four, five, six, seven acres of, um, of clones, I mean, you're talking about a pretty pricey um, investment into your industrial hemp um, business. Um, if you're talking about um, doing seed for grain or fiber, um, you know, you can see here's a variety out of Canada. It's $2.50 a pound. Um, there's another variety, Fatuda, 75 out of France. That's $10 per kilogram. Um, you're talking about a 20 to 25 um, pound per acre seeding rate for grain and then twice that for fiber. So at least this will give you a little bit of an, an idea on how to work out the math or if somebody's asking you a question about the math for or 
um, for, for planting in the field. And I do like to include this. This is a really good resource for people who are just getting started in, in hemp. Um, it's kind of tricky to locate. It's called the e-guide and it's put out by the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance. Um, if you click on that link, it's the only place you can find it at the top left. If you scroll down the page, there's no other link for it. Um, it does give you a production tab which shows some variety selection, some seeding rates, some soil nutrients that you need, nutrient use of the plant, um, some other information. So if, you're, if people who are coming to contact you are interested in growing industrial hemp, this is a good resource to direct them to because it does have some great basic information on growing industrial hemp. And um, here are some resource links, again, um, for people who um, are looking for more information. I mean, definitely check out um, the NCD page before you submit your application. I 100% rec recommend that you read through their application frequently asked questions. That's going to answer 99% of your questions about the application. Um, if you're interested um, in growing industrial hemp, um, we are, we, besides this webinar, we do have live events happening all over the state. They're being hosted by um, extension agents in different counties. You might consider attending one of those. They usually have a panel of growers and processors for you to ask questions to. Um, I give this presentation. There's usually a researcher from NC State that gives a presentation on growing it. So those um, info sessions are super valuable to people who are wishing to get into it. And if you're an extension agent and you're on this um, on this call today and you're interested in hosting one of those info sessions in your county, please feel free to contact me and I can give you more information about how to host an info session in your county. And um, I do like to point out this Cornell hemp guide. It has some great information about um, not only growing industrial hemp, but sort of the market around industrial hemp. Um, if you're looking for variety names so that you can research which variety of industrial hemp might be perfect for you, both Canada and Kentucky keep variety lists with variety names of industrial hemp. So you can click that link and then that bottom link is just that e-grower guide that I showed you um, just a couple slides ago. And then um, you may or may not know, but industrial hemp really has had a long history here in the United States. Um, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, they all wrote of growing um, hemp on their, on their states. Usually that's for that row, for those naval purposes. And, and the military here in the United States did grow industrial hemp, or did grow and utilize industrial hemp in military applications, um, you know, all the way up until World War II. We were importing a lot of hemp from, from Asia for our military. It was used in uniforms, canvas, and rope. Um, but really after the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, America's supply was cut off. And so interestingly, the United States Department of Agriculture launched a campaign um, called um, Grow Hemp for the War, Hemp for Victory, um, to encourage people to grow industrial hemp um, here in the United States. They grew a lot of it in the Midwest. And um, I always kind of find it amusing that um, there's, you know, there's always some kids who find um, some ditch weed, they think it's marijuana, and they try and smoke it. And you really never get high off of it because what it really really is, is um, escaped industrial hemp from the war effort. So um, we really have, a, have had a long history. Um, you can find it here. It used to be grown here in North Carolina, Kentucky, all throughout the South. Um, so um, I think it's great that an old crop is sort of returning to the area. And um, if you have any questions, um, definitely write the program at industrialhemp at ncsu.edu. You, you can schedule a time uh, to speak with me about the program if you have any questions that aren't answered on those online resources. I do travel a bit. Um, I'm actually at the Hemp Summit in Virginia right now giving this uh, webinar from a conference room. So um, sometimes you do have to schedule an appointment to speak with me, but I encourage you to definitely reach out and I can get you some more resources. If if you need those um, to advise people or if you have questions yourself about industrial hemp or the program in North Carolina. And um, thank you guys for having me and let me, letting me talk a little bit about industrial hemp and the industrial hemp program in North Carolina. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a lot of information in a short yes, time. So we do have some, some good questions uh, and we have a few more minutes for that. So uh, the first question is, is there data that shows the average price for CBD for 2017? The chart uh, showed the higher CBD on chemical report from 5% to 20%. Are there 
uh, pricing uh, matrixes for that yet? I don't, I don't know of any place to find that data right now. Um, you might be able to, um, there is a, a online periodical. I think they actually even have a hard copy called, um, gosh, I think it's the Hemp Business Journal. They might have some of those statistics. If, um, if that's not exactly the name, go ahead and shoot me an email and I can send that over to you. And, and that, that might actually have some information along those lines, but um, I don't know of that exact information being available here in North Carolina yet since the program's really only one year old. Okay, thank you. And uh, two more questions. Uh, one, are there financing programs designed to help hemp processors get started? Um, yeah, unfortunately, really the, um, the research funding and the funding available for both growing industrial hemp and for processing industrial hemp for, for even for research um, at state universities on industrial hemp is very, very limited. When you're talking about um, really even industrial hemp programs across the, across the country, you're talking about programs that are only five years old, really. So um, it's really so new that there's not a ton of funding available for industrial hemp, unfortunately. Um, I would like to say that uh, for those of you who are farming in previously very active tobacco counties, the Tobacco Trust Fund uh, does have a grant program for farmers who are transitioning out of tobacco into new uh, agricultural ventures. And I do know that um, those applications, uh, hemp applications are being funded through the Ag Trust Fund. So uh, check, you can check with me about that, um, but that, that is a good option. Um, let's see, uh, does the NC Agronomy Lab give nutrient recommendations for hemp on a soil test? Is there a category to check for at this time? I, um, I know that both um, the, the ag labs at um, the Department of Agriculture and some NC State labs have registered to be able to run tests on industrial hemp. Um, I know that they have been doing um, germination and pests and that kind of thing. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that a soil nutrient analysis would be able to be one of the things that are run by the Department of Agriculture. I'm not sure if there's a soil lab at NC State doing it right now. Um, but if you shoot me an email, I can, um, I can point out the website for the Department of Ag's um, soil testing lab. And um, I can check around and see if any of the state labs at NC State are doing soil testing for hemp. Great, thank you. And one last question, um, is flower hemp, I guess or growing hemp, suitable project for a small farm, or is this generally you think um, profitable for large scale agriculture? I think that um, really I've seen um, in other states, it seems like people are able to make it work both ways. Um, when you're talking about growing it for fiber or grain, it does seem like you more likely need those large acres. But um, I think that, you know, there are so many instances of people growing it in greenhouse space that you don't, it doesn't seem like for um, producing it for floral materials that you do need a large amount to be profitable. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where the market grow, goes with industrial hemp across North Carolina um, because, like I said, this program is only one year old, so we really do need some more statistics on how successful people are within the state. But I do think that a, far, a small farm would be able to be profitable um, here in North Carolina with industrial hemp. Okay, so that's it for our questions. Um, Hi, Laura. Thanks again. We have, we have we have oh, a yeah. couple other questions. Oh. Um, one, is there a supply chain map for the hemp industry in North Carolina so businesses can connect with each other? Nope. Um, right now, there's not a supply chain map, but I did point out that list of processors. So um, I, one, one strategy I think that would be at least somewhat helpful to people is um, go to that list. Uh, there's some phone numbers, there's company names, type those into Google and see if you can't reach out and make contact with those businesses. Um, find out what kind of industrial hemp. Are they processing the fiber? Are they processing the floral materials? Um, start making those connections. Um, in the future, I do hope um, to, to create some sort of listserv that people can voluntarily sign up for to communicate with each other and you know 
put out products and and that kind of thing. Um, that's not available yet, but I'm I'm hoping that maybe that'll be something that we can get out for everybody in 2018. But right now, um, the best way would be to to utilize that process or list and and start making those connections. And Paige also asked if you could speak about the cost of patents that that growers would have to pay on any clones that they grow. Um, uh, what about that process and, and cost? Sorry, I, I didn't catch that first little part. It kind of broke up. Um, Paige asked if you could talk about the cost of patents that growers have to pay on any clones that they grow from their plants. I, I, I don't have any information on that, unfortunately. I do know that um, some, some varieties, I guess, um, do have IP patents on their strains. So um, that definitely could be something that you run into, but I un unfortunately don't have a ton of information. Um, if, if Paige is looking for more information, I can, I can try and look into that. I do have a lot of connections in different states, so I can ask around and see if any other states have um, you know, been experiencing this and what, what, I don't know, what outcomes they've gotten from, from that kind of situation, but I don't have that data just off the top of my head. Okay. Um, Robin would like to know if there'll be a follow-up event at the Salisbury Research Station. Uh, if an agent there wants to uh, host one. <laughs> Um, I'm getting ready to show the uh, where folks can see the schedule of upcoming uh, hemp sessions around the state. Great. Um, Mary would like to know, if, is there a limit to the number of licenses to be issued? Nope. Um, we're very lucky. Um, different states have set up their industrial hemp programs very differently. So some states do have a cap on um, the number of people they'll accept into the program. Right now, um, the commission doesn't have any cap. So as long as you meet the requirements for a license, the um, commission has been very permissive about um, encouraging people to get involved in growing industrial hemp in North Carolina. And I, I haven't heard of any talk about them even wanting to limit the number. So um, I, don't, I don't really foresee that in the future. I guess um, anything could happen, but I, I don't really foresee a, a cap on licenses happening here in North Carolina. Okay, uh, John would like to know how will NCDA testing occur this year? How will NCDA what? Testing occur this year as far as timing. Oh, um, so the way I understand it is um, within 10 days of when your industrial hemp begins to flower, you do need to contact Megan Roche. That's that contact I, sh I showed you earlier and tell her of that. And an inspector will come out and take a sample of your industrial hemp plants. Um, that's a random sample. So they probably, let's say you have an acre, they take, I don't know, 10, 20 tops of your plants. Um, the inspector will take those back to the lab. The lab does run those tests on them. And I've heard the turnaround time for when the sample arrives at the lab is about four days. Um, and then you'll know the results of your, of your THC test, your official test. So that's sort of how, that's sort of the general overview of how that works. Okay. All right, well, Emily and Laura, that was all the questions that I had gotten. Okay, great. Emily, can you switch your uh, screen over to me? Yep. Maybe. Let's see. So, share screen. And of course, now I don't know. Yeah, you should see um, stop share. Yep, found it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so hopefully you're seeing the slide that says information of this site. Uh, Laura, so, you'll uh, need to, Emily referenced this. Site. You'll need to screen share. We see you, but we okay. don't see your screen. Okay. 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 Is that working? Uh, just click share screen and then desktop. Okay. Let's see. I am not seeing that. Yeah, so the, it's it's a little green button. It should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen. 
Yeah, I have lost my screen. Um, how, about if, how about if I pull it back up and then you just talk and I'll just yeah, go through the that'd, lab. That'd be great. I'll just, just talk through it. Okay. So um, the next slide is, or do you have it up yet? Um, can you guys see that? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So uh, if you go to the next slide, the for, the for, more, for more information slide, there we go. So if you see that, um, for more information, uh, Emily referenced this slide earlier, and you can see where the green arrow is. There's two more, um, there's two sessions coming up, one March 5th in Granville County, and one March 19th in Chatham County. And these are hour long, you know, a couple of hour sessions. Um, as Emily was referencing, the researchers will be there. They can share what was happening in the field uh, the last year in 2017. And also uh, Emily will be there and some folks from the, uh, I believe from the North Carolina Hemp Organization uh, will be there as well. So I highly recommend that. And again, for um, agents that are on the call or on the webinar, uh, you can reach out to Emily for organizing uh, the same type of of meeting in your county. And then the next slide, um, we just want to uh, introduce the upcoming webinars. Uh, the business of food safety for processed products are coming um, on with uh, two food scientists from NC State talking about the new food safety laws and, and what entrepreneurs need to understand about those laws um, and how it affects their businesses as they develop. And the next one for um, April coming up, next slide, is um, from NCDA. So for folks who have farm businesses and or want to take it to the next level, the NCDA has fantastic uh, resources for helping farmers um, go to that next level. So perhaps if farmers have been to the Small Business Center and their farmer, their farmer food business has launched, this is the next step. And so if anybody has met or seen uh, Annette Dunlap speak, um, she is a, a wonderful source of uh, information and a farmer herself. So I highly recommend that. And uh, so those two registrations are up. And in May, we're going to uh, focus on tourism with uh, Annie Baggett from NCDA. In June, the business of organic with Mark Dempsey from CFSA. So that's it for today. We surely appreciate your participation and, and we're all very excited about hemp and hope that uh, this, uh, this information, though it's a lot of information, helped whet your appetite uh, to learn more and, helped, um, and help you understand how to help farmers who are interested. So thank you very much, Terry. Thank you, Emily, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. And be sure and let us know if there's another topic that you're interested in. Thank you, everybody.